Welcome back to CCC 2020, July 26. We are going to be heading into the elimination bracket stage. The first game in the bracket stage is going to be the quarterfinals here between Team Morgan, or well, Shareworks by Morgan Stanley versus Payson. With Team Payson on the blue team and Team Shareworks taking the red side. The ready checks have gone through. We will be heading into pick and ban very soon. So these two teams have met yesterday, however, they have made a few player substitutions here on the side of Team Shareworks. Yes, I will continue to call them Shareworks. Although I do believe their team name is Stanley and their company is Shareworks by Morgan Stanley. I will call them Shareworks just for gravity. And we are heading into the pick and bans here. Team Payson will ban out the Trinomir and Team Shareworks will respawn with the Lee Sin. Top and jungle pools being pinched here very early on. These two teams have met in yesterday's game where Team Paysong climbed out very quickly to a smashing victory. But Team Shareworks today, they have made adjustments, they made player substitutions, and they banned out the Graves. The highlight of uh, yesterday's cast was definitely that Graves 1v3 moment, and Shareworks says, Nah, nah, not again. We're not letting that happen again. And they do go ahead and take out the Graves, however, that does make it so that that's the second jungle ban. A third one might be coming in very soon here. Uh, are they gonna do it? The ban's coming in. What is going to be their pick? It is going to be a Galio ban, yes. Going to once again pinch away at the mid pool. The Galio Graves combo does make for an extremely skirmishy pick and there is a Scion top lane going back to the comfort pick here for the top lane in Team Payson. They are going to be going up against some picks coming out from Red Team as well. Now we'll see what Red Team wants to prioritize here. There are a few ways you could do about this. You could mash the top lane or you could pick your jungle mid or your bot lane in this rotation. And we'll see what their choice here is going to be. It is going to be the Nautilus support. Oh no, wait, this is... We've seen this yesterday, this is Nautilus top. It is going to be Nautilus top answering the Scion pick. Instead of mid lane. Oh, the Fizz is coming out, maybe? Gragas Annie? This does appear to be the mid lane picking here. And it is going to be the mid lane Annie being picked up. She definitely brings a lot of teamfight, a lot of burst power, and a lot of CC to boot. Not stellar in the super damage department compared to other AP mids, but definitely still a very strong pick. At least jungle was Malphite being picked up as well. Oh, is that Malphite mid? That may very well just be Malphite mid. I can I certainly cannot see a Scion mid pick happening. And the jungler here from t red team perhaps they might just pick their jungler on this rotation no it will be the ash pick and here we are heading into the second round of bans i have gone on record on my opinions about ash i said this yesterday but i'll repeat it here i don't like ash i think she's a very low damage ad carry that brings more utility than damage which is fine but the blunder i see that most teams make when they make an ash is that they fail to support that utility Oftentimes, Ash is your only damage dealer when you drop Ash comps, and that just kind of blows up in your face because you just run out of damage later on. The Ezreal is going to be banned. It's definitely a very scary pick. If it goes to late game, that's just so much damage, way more than the way more than Shareworks can handle. Urgot is going to be taken away from the top lane. Although, are they assuming it's not Nautilus top because they are still continuing to ban out top laners? Given yesterday's match. Uh, that has played out. I would assume that is Nautilus top. It was brought out yesterday. We'll see what their last ban is going to be here. They might just look to pinch more AD carry pools away. Uh, it is going to be a support ban in the Braum. Certainly very tanky. It can lay down a lot of CC and provide so much disruption. And uh, what is going to be Payson's final response here? They can still try to remove the jungler because it doesn't seem like any of those champions can jungle. Which jungler will they remove if they do go that route though? Who dares they will remove the will. Jarvan. The Jarvan was the jungle ban. And now we go back to the pick phase in the second round. The Swain coming out. 
So the swing here is most definitely a flex pick. He can go top, he can go mid, he can go support, he can go anywhere. So it's very rough to guess where that lane is gonna be. It might just be a bottom lane swing though. Bottom lane swing with an Ash is definitely very scary. If you get grabbed, you're not coming back out. And that's going to be once again the Kaelin for very early laning power. And the last pick missing on Paison is the support Thrash coming out. Another hook champion to complement the team composition. And of course, the final pick is going to be Team Shareworks Jungler, which is Hecarim. All right, now 45 seconds out, we will be heading into the first game of the bracket stage. This is going to be quote unquote quarterfinals, I guess. The winner of this will advance into the semifinal bracket and then the grand finals. Uh, since Team Paysong has finished third in the place, actually, let me bring up the bracket again just to make sure. Um, let me see if I can, while we're waiting, let me see if I can bring up the bracket here. So Team Payson does indeed play third seed. After that tiebreaker, they do end third. They're going up to Team Stanley. And then they will play the winners of uh either either TC Energy or PWC, both teams which have beaten them, if they win this game. And then they will move in and compete for first place. So that is going to be how the bracket is shaping up. They need to beat Team Stanley here, and then move on to defeat either one of the two teams that have beaten them yesterday. So that is how the bracket is going to be shaping up here. It is going to be a very exciting match down in the other bracket where we have seen Team PWC and Team TC Energy, both of which showcase us some very high level play. And they get to clash first in the first round of the quarterfinals. So that would have been a very exciting match. However, the match that we're currently casting now is also going to be happening on the top side of the bracket. The loser of this game will have to drop down to compete for, I believe, 5th or 6th? Is that how the bracket is shaping up? Yeah, the, the loser of this game will drop down to compete for 5th or 6th. So this is definitely a very high stakes game. You do not want to lose this game. <laughs> These are single elimination games happening as well, of course. So really, it is up to Team Pesa and Team Shareworks to advance themselves forward in this bracket. But of course, no matter which teams comes out ahead, they have a hell of a task waiting for them just coming up with two juggernauts of uh, League of Legends teams that are awaiting them in the next game. Now, a minute and 30 out, we will be heading into the next match. Just 90 seconds. I do say just off the team drafts here, I do favor blue team here a little bit. I just think that unless the Hecarim on team Shareworks gets rolling, they might run into a damage issue here. Of course, once again, this is a very single threat team being drafted from the Payson. They do favor this kind of team uh, team style extensively. Just a ton of frontline supporting a single AD carry. But if you're doing that and your support is a Thresh, I wouldn't necessarily rely on a Caitlyn pick. Because if you're, unless your team gets super ahead, this kind of team con just does not work. Caitlyn needs a lot more protection, uh, direct protection that is. If you're running a ton of frontliners, you might actually be more reliant on a pick like Aphelios, perhaps, to actually run in with your tank core, as opposed to standing in the back and shooting. A lot of your tanks in this game do have one-way tickets into engagers, and once they get into the team, they're not going to walk back out to peel for your AD carry. So you really need another AD carry, like a Sivir or an Aphelios, perhaps, that can run in with them. If the support was an enchanter pick, like perhaps Lulu, or perhaps uh, even Nami, or Soraka, I think you could justify a further, longer range ADC here. But this is definitely a team on Team Payson that screams, we need to get ahead, we need to shut down the horse. Otherwise, it's over for us. So we are going to be heading into the game here. Game 1 of the quarterfinals will begin. Payson versus Shareworks by Morgan Stanley. Let's get it started. May all players give it their all and may we have a fantastic game on our hands. It is in fact Nautilus top, I mean why did I even question it? Although with Annie taking Aftershock, 
That is a very interesting rune choice for the Annie. The Annie does get a stun up decently quickly, although I'm not sure if that would justify an Aftershock pick. It does seem like it's Aftershock plus free boots or something for the Annie. It seems like a lot more utility, but Annie usually doesn't build tankier items like Rowell. Unless you're laning top with Annie, you go into Ludens or something. And in those cases, unless your name is Lissandra, you probably wouldn't actually run Aftershock. you just run Electrocute or something instead to double down on the damage output. So it's interesting to me that the Annie here picks the Aftershock unless she's going support. If she's going support, that might actually change the, change the story a little bit. We are going to be loading into the game here. And convincing stopwatches, right. So instead of free boost, Annie will take the stopwatch along with the Swain. And it is going to be the Swain support. It is in fact Annie middle with the Doran's ring. And now both teams are running out. It does seem like a more standard opener. Nautilus seems like he's running topside and so is the Scion. There's not going to be any early inways it seems like. And these, in, these, uh, <laughs> in these CCC games, there has... There hasn't been any early invades coming, has there? Oh, Ash. Oh, wait. I may have spoken too soon. Oh, they just miss each other around the bend of the pit. I don't think Ash spot. I don't think Swain spot. No, Swain must have spotted them. But I don't think. Uh, I don't think Team Payson was aware that Ash was hiding in the pit. Oh, the claw is going to come in and the Ash is going to start shooting. It is going to be a lethal tempo ash as opposed to hail of blades. So this is not this is not going to be the variant of ash that goes triforce and gets arrow cooldown as low as possible. This is just going to be the uh, standard lethal tempo build. You get blades of the rune king and everything else. So bot lane, they're not going to leash because the jungler is starting top side here for team Payson. So the bottom lane here for team Payson is just going to walk in and start the laning phase immediately. And who knows, maybe they could even camp out in that river brush if they so desire, but I don't think they beat Swain and Ash level 1. Unless Caitlyn lands a sick peacemaker, it's not happening. They are going to go ahead and start farming. It is going to be a Malphite mid, and he does open Doran's ring, so maybe this is AP Malphite as opposed to tank. An AP Malphite would be very interesting here. Uh, definitely very powerful deletion abilities on the back line. Oh wait, the scoreboard. Ha, the scoreboard, the scoreboard. How could I have forgotten to arrange the scoreboard? Malphite is just gonna farm up against the Annie. He does do a ton of damage, but he needs to watch out. He is a very, very mana hungry champion. Which is why you take Comet, even for a tank Malphite, because you need mana flow band really badly just to stay in lane by sustaining your mana cost and beautiful hook here landing out from the Thresh but here comes the Vision of Empire Eclipse onto the Caitlyn but it is Ash who loses the game of chicken going to heal Flash away Scion top lane is still getting bullied out by the Nautilus we've seen this matchup yesterday where Nautilus did come out ahead in the laning phase he gets the early CS lead but then he's just less useful in team fights. That composed of the sound, but the Caitlyn! Oh no, she's gonna die! The Ignite kills her option, she flashed as well! The Sway will flash after her, but here comes the Elise for the cleanup! Team Shareworks, they do not get to relish in their victory as here comes a very angry spider. The Flay completely whips, but the Repel will finish the job. Double kill going over to the jungler. Unfortunately, Caitlyn did lose her flash, but Team Payson does manage to salvage it. The Malphite is flashing forward, he's committing for the kill, but the Annie can't die here. The Ignite Tick will not finish her off. The Malphite is out of mana, he's out of health, unless the Elise can come bail him out. He will be safe, and now he's gonna head back home. He did blow both his combat summoners to try to kill off the Annie, but he really overestimated how much damage his Ignite will do. Annie is just safe and sound, she makes her way out of there, no problems whatsoever. At 4 minutes in, the jungler mops up bot lane. The team Payson goes out to a slight gold lead, and now Caitlyn gets a fat wave to farm for herself. She is gonna go home and get a call to get even more income, even quicker. Here comes the Hecarim, he's riding down onto the Malphite, he's come back for the return gank, 
Can he make his way out of flash forwards? Double flash committed after Malphite has dead. Uh, Malphite is dead, rather. But here comes the bot lane gank. The Caitlyn does kill off the Ash and the trap. Beautifully leading the Swain's movement. It's gonna give Caitlyn that double kill. And suddenly the bot lane skyrocketing ahead yet again here in game uh, in the quarterfinals game. It's kind of like a repeat of yesterday, isn't it? Where the jungler and the AD carry are really writing the story of the game here by being really strong early on. And the Ash still sitting in single digit farm and she's gone back for a dagger. That's gotta hurt when you're playing AD carry, when you're back with so little gold that all you pick up is a dagger and a health pot. Although in situations like this, unless you have magical footwear, definitely buy boots before dagger. That is the way better item. <laughs> She is just going to come back and try to mop up some CS, but it is an Ash. It is very hard to last another tower with no additional attack damage. So most of that minion is just going to be mopped up by the tower instead of into Ash's pockets. It's just insult to injury, really. It's When you're so weak, you can't really farm under tower, but that's the only place where you can farm. And unfortunately, there's a disregard for laning... Uh, for laning wave management here by the Ash, as opposed to setting up for a freeze to try to get really strong, they are going to try to auto out the wave instead. And that is just going to set up a slow push back towards Team Payson's tower from where Kaelin will collect additional income. And it is something that's been kind of the trend in the tournament in general. Very few teams, I say none so far actually in this tournament, uh, considering the average skill level that we are involved with. Uh, none of them have really had really solid wave management in the early laning phase, so a lot of times it's these minions going all over the place. And oftentimes, if the lane management goes bad, it is actually a really, really fast way to silently lose a game. And we are seeing that on full display here from Team Shareworks, where once again they have a slow push being set up, six caster minions as opposed to three. I mean, if Pesa. If the pace on bot lane wasn't so ahead, they might just let this happen and just set up a freeze onto the bot, but they can just mop up kills instead as the Elise arrives. The Swain has to try to get out, but he cannot make it. The another dive coming in from the Elise, double kill onto the backline. Bot lane for Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley here, not catching a break. 2.3 thousand gold ahead, and there it is. The Hecarim is riding mid. He stomps onto a mini to try to get closer, but that is no additional CC for the Malphite. He'll just walk away, and the Anticom is Tibbers! Uh, the Tibbers will just get angry and slap the rock a few times, but he'll be fine. He'll just walk away. And in fact, Tibbers loses most of his life. That tower shot will have killed him. And the Hecarim gets found in the river. The spider bite will finish him off. And there it is. Thresh will take that kill. And that is going to be a dragon as well on top of everything. Team Pesa is off to such an incredibly large lead very early on. This amount of gold lead was way higher than what we saw in the tiebreaker game in half the time. It is early game dominance here by Team Pesa. And that is the story of their game so far. With the dragon being taken early, Harold gonna be coming on the plate very soon as well. This game is uh, going very well in their favor. Back things are coming out. They do try to uh, get the Malphite away from the Annie. The Annie still has the ignite but no flash. And because she lacks a combat summoner, uh, other than, well, she lacks a move speed summoner other than flash which is on cooldown, she doesn't have a goal, she doesn't have like a spellbinder or anything. She can't really just run into the Malphite's face and finish him off, so the Malphite will just back safely. The Annie won't get to punish him and he does actually hold a CS lead over the Annie here. But meanwhile top lane, the Nautilus, he's winning this lane in terms of CS so far. But it is the curse of top Nautilus where you may win the lane, even if you do win the lane. You're not gonna do much with it. You still just not contribute as much to a late game team fight because Death's Charge is definitely not as useful in stability as basically Scion's kit, where he can engage from a really long range away. So really, it's up to the Nautilus to not just win the lane, but to shut down the Scion entirely. And the onus is definitely on him to perform just that in this game. The Swain walking up slightly too far forward. He was making himself a free target for a hook there. 
But luckily for Team Shareworks, uh, Payson did not commit to that play. A Lantern is going to be coming out, and a Long Range Hook is going to force out the Ash Flash. The Never Move from the Swing will not connect, but the Vigil of the Empire sure will. It's going to rip away for Soul from the Thresh. Here it comes. The Never Move Claw is coming out. Kaylin's slowly walking forward, but she can't do it here. The Scion going out for an aggressive trade. Both players are shielded, and there it is! The unstoppable charge cannot be stopped by the Hecarim hoof stomp, and because Hecarim's already gone past the Scion, he doesn't even interrupt the Scion train, and Scion will just escape beautifully. A poorly timed engage by Hecarim, all things considered. And he's just hit level 6, he does have Onslaught of Shadows. But he hasn't really used it yet on any of the laners. And speaking of, this is actually a very low CS game coming out from both spin laners here. The Tibbers, oh, is going to be committed yet again to scare off the Malphite. And the Malphite, he is committing to a tank build. Look at that. Although I wonder why pick up a Sapphire Crystal alongside Bami Cinder, because I will repeat this from last game, they do not build into one item. And here comes the Elise once again, and the Swain is going to pop his ultimate, but it's not enough. He barely gets to lifesteal anything before going down, and the Caitlyn is not going to get the Ash kill, but the Elise will mop it up instead. 10 kills, all 10 of which has a kill participation given to Elise. Once again, the perfect kill particip par uh, participation game coming out from the Elise. The Spooter is certainly very scary here. Scion does get hooked back by the Nautilus, the Anchors are swinging down. The Scion is safe, Nautilus has very very little kill power in lane. So even at that health, the Scion is not going to die unless the uh, Hecarim has something to say about it. He's just going to come in and turn the dead man into another dead man as the zombie runs forward. But the Malphite, he's committing for an all-in. Flash forward, beautiful solo kill by Team Payson. They do kill off the Annie here, 11-3. In fact, the three kills split pretty evenly across red team. Uh, Swain's only kill was onto a Caitlyn, and that was a very high value kill by the way. With an Ignite, you get a Caitlyn flash and her life. <laughs> but it doesn't even matter as the Caitlyn so far ahead now. They lost first turret at 11 and a half minutes in. So that's five plays and first tower goal going over to uh, Payson's bot lane. And that's just going to get them even more ahead. And right now, the pace of the game has just been accelerated so incredibly quickly. As you can see, pace on bot lane rotates top. That is going to be the next destination where they will wreak havoc. And unfortunately, the Nautilus, this is what I mean about timing, man. He's not prepared for this. He spilled Merc Treads and Bami Cinder, so he can't handle the AD carry. He sees bot lane coming up, panic buys a Warden's Mail, which is definitely the completely wrong item to buy, by the way. That literally anything else would have been better. Like Chain Vest plus two pinks would have been better than a Warden's Mail. He is going to get hooked out here. The trap does land onto him. The Caitlyn combo is there, but the Death Shards gets committed. Is it going to be enough? Dredge Line will pull her back. Oh, the Traveler Shots! It will not kill, but he steps onto a trap, and the Caitlyn will kill him off. But he came so close to killing off the Caitlyn there. That was an amazing play by the Nautilus, but unfortunately, it just wasn't enough. He's just not tanky enough yet to pull off that play and survive. The Elise will make her way top, and this is going to be the next turret to be sieged here by Team Pesa. And so far, Shareworks... They're not responding to this play whatsoever. They're sending three members to claim a dragon to try to equalize the global objective score. But that is currently not their biggest concern. Their top lane is in shambles and nobody is coming up to defend. Nobody is recalling for this. They're just going to gank mid instead. But they might not be able to kill the Malphite, the unstoppable onslaught. Well, onslaught of shadows rather. It goes at the wrong angle and sends Malphite back to his own tower instead of towards the... Uh, waiting arms of Team Shareworks, and that is just going to be another red team taken. This is 10 plates in the very early game. Turret plating may have fallen, but 10 of those have been killed. That is such a, a huge amount of income going over to Team Pesa. Now, Kaylin coming back, she's got Storm Razor done. She's almost got boost done compared to the Ash, who's still sitting on a Cutlass, which really, on its own, it's not a, it's not a fantastic item on the Ash. It's only when it's finished. It's only when you get the Recurve Bolt component and you get to shoot super fast. That's when Blade of the Rune King starts getting all its value. But the standalone Cutlass, 
It's really an underwhelming item for this price tag. But here it comes, the siege is coming down mid, this is a very formulaic game here by Team Pesa. They're just going to siege every tower one at a time, and the hook will not hit the Annie, but she will be sent back regardless. She has Aftershock, but if she is so far behind that she can't get up to do the damage, it doesn't even matter if you have Aftershock. Which is why Lissandra can get away with that Keystone, but Annie cannot. Because you can't really jump into a fight instantly with Annie. The trap is going to be hidden by the turret do that. And if someone was to step on it, that'd be a lot of damage and the Swain does step on it! Yeah, uh, let's... <laughs> Hold on, I, I, my brain blanked on a little bit. The Malphite does overdive and he does die. And the Hecarim is gonna try to flash away from the very scary spider. He's contracted Arachnophobia. And here comes the Nautilus, the dredge line will not hit the wall. And he will be killed off instead. Caitlyn will kill off the Ash as well. And here comes the Annie, she doesn't have flash, she doesn't have ghost. DW will still cause the Thresh to flash? That was a panic flash and a half, but now he's trying to re-engage. He's found the courage to come back in, but he can't find that hook. Red team, however, will still lose their third turret. 8,000 gold lead here for Team Pace on This game is just getting out of hand. Assist me, please. Pings are coming down onto the mid lane turret. But Team Payson will not commit any further, they will go home, Riches lining their pockets, and they will look to drastically up their power level here. Infinity Edge is complete on the Caitlyn as well, she sold the call to make that happen. Now she just needs to finish her tier 2 boots, Magical Footwear is done on the Ash as well. And she does have the uh, Blade of the Rune King complete right now as well, but right now, Blade of the Rune King is, is a piece of cloth in the wind compared to Storm Razor Eye Edge. This is a stupidly strong Caitlyn. She can just kill people in two hits if she crits both one of them is a headshot. But it's gonna be so easy for her to kill whoever she wants. The Annie has to be careful. The Lantern is coming out and the Annie immediately pops Molten Shield to get out. The, the, once again, this is the problem. If you have Aftershock, you need a way to reliably apply it from a really long way away. Lissandra can run away with it because she can call in and CC people immediately. But Annie, her only tool instantly into a fight is Flash. Molten Shield speed boost is just not fast enough to get you in on time. And if you're so behind like this, you don't even have Ludens Echoes finished and you don't have tier 2 boots, you're just going to die before you can get in. And I think right now Team Shareworks must have realized that's going to be the common theme of their whole team. As Nautilus, he's working hard on finishing his Randun's Omen. But still, sitting on components like Bami Cinder is very low value. There used to be a time where, you know, it was the cookie cutter top lane build. Where your starting build was actually uh, Boots plus uh, Bami Cinder plus Bramble Vest. And then you look to finish an item. But the days of that cookie cutter build has long since gone. Uh, the meta is just no longer favorable to that kind of build. It would delay your major item power spikes by far too much uh, for that play to be worth it. Oh, but the Thresh, he might be caught out here, but the Timber, it completely whiffs! And the Thresh might just be able to walk away here thanks to the Summoner heal. The Annie is still giving chase, but I don't think she can make this happen. Tibbers is just going to be shot down here by the Water Gun. However, Team Shareworks, they have found themselves a troll of wars and do get a ton of wars killed off, and they grab the vision. However, the Infernal Drake is spawning, and Team Pace on, they have no intention of giving this up. They're coming in to fight this. The word, there's no pink in the pit. Oh no, there's no there's no word in the river. Oh, they can't see this happening, and here is the Unstoppable Charge coming in, the Scion coming in from behind as well, the flank is coming in, the bodies are dropping, there's so many dead on the ground instantly. Shareworks cannot catch a break, and they just give up four bodies on top of the Drake. What a landslide victory here by Team Pesa, just 10,000 gold ahead, 18 minutes in. Luden's Echo is complete on the Annie. Stopwatch is ready as well, but she has never found a good time to use it. That last fight was just abysmal, there was no Tibbers, there was no Crystal Arrow. And they couldn't make that play happen. The stopwatch wouldn't have done anything. Because you stasis for 2.5 seconds, you come out with nothing. You go in with nothing and you come out with uh, come out an even poorer man. 
And now the test has really begun. Shadowworks has such a huge mountain to climb. They need to make a miracle happen for this game to turn it in their favor, but can they make it happen? They are going to try something proactive. They're moving five men down the mid lane. They need that tower dead. They really want that tower dead. But as long as Team Payson has defenders, it's just throwing corpses at a wall. Sure, it might make an impact, but it's still a brick wall and it's not going to fall. But the Scion, he might have walked up way too forward here. He is going to flash away. The Lantern has been tossed a little bit too far off center and he was not going to be able to grab that. The re-engage here, it might be coming in, but Kaylin, she's not back to the scene of the crime just yet. Ten thousand gold ahead for uh, Team Paysan. Oh my goodness! I that's just really funny to me. I'll explain why in a bit. But here's a team fight that's breaking out. The Swain is just going to pop his ultimate, but he is not going to life steal nearly enough. The flash forward from the Mal fight. The unstoppable charge comes out, and there is the Ash dead once again. A Mal fight. He's going to get himself another one. These instant engagers are paying off in space here for Team Pesa. Twelve thousand gold ahead. They're gonna start the Baron. And back to what I was talking about that that fight being funny. Uh, at least Spider bit Hecarim at full health and then Neurotoxin him at low health, which is the exact opposite of what you should do because Neurotoxin does current health and uh, Paralyzing Bite does missing health. But she did it in the other way. She used the execution to start and the start to execute. And because she's so fed, it still killed him. <laughs> this Hecarim doesn't have a shred of magic resist on him. And this Elise with Lyandry Stun, Oblivion Orb, Runic Echoes. Yeah, she can get away with that play. She could combo in the completely opposite order and still kill somebody. And that's when you really know, oh, maybe this game's over. Payson has hit 40,000 total net worth, where Team Shareworks, they haven't even hit 30. The Rift Herald is going to be summoned in mid lane. They are going to try to write that down into a mid lane push. Unstoppable Force from Malphite is going to be coming up pretty soon, as well as the uh, Mal uh, the Scion all as well. But the Annie is going to get picked up before the fight even begins. And here comes the uh, Onslaught of Shadows, going to fear up the backline. But the Swain is already dead. The Paralyzing Bite from the Elise will finish off the Hecarim as well. The Ash is the next to go. It's just a Nautilus alive. Nobody on Payson has died yet. And they want this last kill. The top laner has to just run for the hills and hope for the best. He does have Randuin's complete, but at this point, that's the least of his worries. There's so much damage coming out from Pesa. There's no item in the world that can protect you against that amount of power. And they are just going to lay siege to Team Shellworks base. They're going for the jugular. They're going for the end. Can they do it here? The Nexus is wide open. 22 minutes in. Even faster game than the Payson Shellworks game from yesterday. My voice cracked. I'm so sorry. And Team Pesa going to take the first game. They move on into the semi-final bracket and Team Shareworks is going to now compete in the 5th, 6th place match. I believe, uh, if I read the bracket right, I'm not sure if I did, I don't know how to read brackets. Now let's see some end of game stats here. Whew. Yeah, this game was very much a story about Elise and Caitlyn and this graph most definitely shows it. What an impressive game here, coming out from Team Payson, recovering very well after their defeat in the tiebreaker match. And now, we will move on into the semi-final matchup.